Hi, I'm Molly. And I'm Jamie, and this is our From the Pasture with Hired Hand podcast. As the owners of Hired Hand website software, we've been developing websites and creating internet marketing strategies for livestock breeders for the past 10 years. The majority of our customers are involved in the breeding of registered animals, such as Texas Longhorns, Highland Cattle, Horses, and White-tailed Deer, where the pedigrees are very important. The From the Pasture with Hired Hand podcast examines many of the differences in raising pedigreed livestock for maximum profit. Join us and learn what we're covering today. Today on our podcast, I'm super excited about the guest that we have. She's joining us all of the way from Mühlfurter, Austria. Did I I get even close? Yes, that's good. (laughs) Okay. So I'm here with Lisa Hanlos, and uh, her ranch is located in Upper Austria, uh, which is in Oberösterreich County, right? <laughs> Perfect. Um, so why don't you start, Lisa, by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, what to say? Um, I come from a non-farming background, so uh, whenever I was raised with my siblings, we did have a lot of animals, but just pets, you know, like turtles and dogs and cats and all that, but no livestock at all. And then I had a short period of a corporate life where I sold forklift trucks um, all over the world, basically. (laughs) And then my husband and I, we decided to move to the countryside and um, to find a nice place where we can raise our kids. By that time, I had a horse, a dog, and two cats. So no big farm at all. And it was never the plan to have a farm. So I just wanted to have my horse at home and maybe a friend of my horse. And yes, then we found a very nice little property, which is very, very small compared to the ranches you have over there. And we tried to to rebuild the house because there was a a little house there. It, It used to be a turkey farm. And it was terrible. It was really rotten, and it smelled like dead turkeys all over the place. So it was oh no, not very nice. But um, yeah, so we decided to tear down the house and rebuild it, and that should be the place where we can raise our kids. And I could have my horses there, and you know, have a happy life. And then the Austrian government, which is very great in every aspect there is. Um, They said, yeah, if you want to tear down the farmhouse, you need to rebuild a farmhouse and you have to have a farm. And we're like, yeah, we're gonna have horses. They're farm animals. And they're like, no, 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 no. You need to do an agriculture. And we're like, okay, shoot. What do we do now? (laughs) So they kind of forced us to get longhorns in a way. Well, not really longhorns, but uh, I was researching then on the internet to see, well, what could we do with the little tiny bit of land that we have to make some sort of profitable farm? And I mean, we had no knowledge at all. And so I was looking on the internet and I came across different kinds of goats, like cashmere goats, but then I discovered you have to brush them every day. And I said, okay, I would need like a hundred goats to be profitable. And I need to brush a hundred goats twice a day. I'm not going to do that. Okay, no goats. <laughs> and then we came across pigs. I was like, pigs? What do we do with pigs? Well, we could raise them and we could like slaughter them for meat. But, you know, they're so cute. And they're so, could I slaughter pigs, you know, if I like them and, it's not really profitable either. So we said, okay, maybe no pigs, no pigs. And then I found longhorns. And I used to live in Texas for a year when I was a student, when I was 16 years old. So I went to high school for my junior year. And I was like, wait a minute. I saw these really, really beautiful cows over there. And that would be a great idea. I mean, they would fit to my American quarter horse and to kind of, yeah. So I searched on the internet if there's a way to have longhorns in Austria. <clears throat> and I found a breeder actually in Austria and I went there straight and then I saw them and I was like, I looked at my husband and said, we need those cows. <laughs> we, we, we need those cows. It doesn't happen. So 
he was like, no, we're not going to get cows. I mean, we have no clue about cows. I mean, we don't know what, you know. <laughs> but I was stronger. <laughs> the life always wins, right? <laughs> yes. No, and then um, I did more research and the calculations, and I was like, you know, it's profitable. We could, you know, make a break even at least or earn a bit of money with it. So that would be a good deal overall. We pleased the Austrian government by doing some agriculture on our land and we make some money with it. And they're pretty. They're the prettiest cows in the world. So, and then we're like, yeah, okay. We don't know. So we looked at another breeder in Germany that I found on the internet and she's actually the largest breeder. Um, she has the biggest herd in, in Europe back then. And we went there and we looked at them and it was just perfect. I mean, she, she just got us so on board. And, and then I said, okay, well, um, but she told me, you know, if you want calves, you need to order them now because she sold out for two years. Oh, wow. Like, but that would give us some time, you know, to get a bit of cattle knowledge and to prepare and to build the barn accordingly and everything. And then I decided, okay, I'm going to order some calves for in two years. And that's what we did. And so we ordered six calves. Um, in, here in Europe, usually only calves are sold. So there's not a lot of fully grown cattle in Longhorns that are being sold. So you kind of don't really know what you get. So okay. um, we ordered five females in the bowl. And whenever they were born, um, she sent me pictures and then we kind of selected them. There was not that big of a selection. There was just, you know, a few calves. And we had to make sure that they matched the bull, that there's no inbreeding. And yes, that's how we, how we kind of got started. So I'm just thinking about a lot of the breeders here that I interview, you know, and it's like, they talk about it being an addiction, right? Like they see these longhorns and they just have to have some, but they're going out and literally the next day they can go purchase 10 full grown steers or females or whatever they want, you know, to start that, yeah. to start that, uh, their herd and that obsession. But you all truly, like you're truly starting from scratch. Not only did you have to be patient and wait two years for the calves, but then you're starting off with calves. So it's going to be a few years before you see those iconic horns, you know, like you saw in high school out in the Texas pastures and stuff. That's, that's a lot of patience. It is, it is. And it's terrible. But <laughs> on the other hand, I'm really glad I don't have the opportunity to just go out and buy longhorns because I'd be broke by now. <laughs> really broke. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really, really happy. You know, when I looked for longhorns here in Europe, I was like, I know that they're bringing horses over from the U.S. to Austria all the time, you know, um, especially quarter horses. So I was like, I can buy cows in the U.S. and get them over here just by plane. So I called the horse transport agency and I said, do you do cattle as well? And they're like, from the U.S. to Europe? I was like, yeah, totally excited. And they're like, are you crazy? Like, no, why, why not? I mean, it's not that different. I would not get a fully grown longhorn, maybe like a one and a half year old or something. So the horns are not going to be that big. So they're like, you're not able to import live cattle from the U.S. to Europe. I was like, why not? It's like a horse. And they're like, no, it's a ruminant. You can't import ruminant from the U.S. to Europe. And that kind of totally smashed it. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so, so why is that? Did they, I mean, did you research that or did they explain it to you? Like, why is there that difference with cattle? It's because of disease, basically. We have very strict laws in Europe for, you know, tracing cattle. Every cattle has to have two ear tags with an identification number. So you don't have that. You have a branding, but you don't have a, they have to be put on the internet seven days after a calf is born. You have to ear tag it and you have to register it with the ear tag. You have to order them from the state vet. Um, so they can trace where every cattle in Europe is located 
at the specific time. And there is a lot of things going on with disease. So um, you guys in the U.S., you vaccinate like everything. Um, and we don't do that over here. So, for example, I can't even import cattle from different states in Europe if they're vaccinated, because when they come to Austria and they pull blood and they look for antibodies, they don't know if the antibodies come from the vaccination or come from a disease. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't know that before. I was so green. I was like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I tried to find ways to go through another country, which is non-EU, but has an agreement with your, uh, but it's no way. So I guess that leads me to question, um, like the, the lady you mentioned who had the largest herd in Germany, um, how do, how do folks like that get started? Or like, how did, how did Longhorns come to be, you know, in that, that part of Europe and everything? Yes. Um, there is actually two different ways. So a few breeders started importing embryos which is possible. Don't ask me why it is possible, but you can import embryos and put them in a cow here and have the calf being born in Europe. Um, so that's possible, but um, the bulls and the cows that are flushed need special testing in the U.S. and special certifications and all that. So it's not that easy. And there is a few longhorn breeders who are doing that in the U.S. for Europe, but it's not very many. They so have very, very limited selection of embryos that are certified for Europe. And it's really expensive. So you need to pay the embryo. You need to bring it over here. You need to place it in a cow. And I have the feeling that the vets over here are sometimes not so ready for doing embryo transfer. So we have, I know a few breeders who are doing that and they have a success rate of about 40 to 60 percent so yeah so that's a lot of investment to get it over there and then not necessarily know if it's going to be successful yes i know a breeder in in belgium who bought like nine embryos and he has one bull calf now wow. so that bull calf is really expensive <laughs> and yeah well let's go back a little bit to the two years Two years, you know, you you ordered your calves. Talk talk me through how those two years progressed for the work that you did on your farm, how you prepared for them, when you brought them home. Tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of research on the internet and I watched a lot of YouTube videos on how to build a barn. Um, and here in Austria or in Europe in general, space is very limited. So you don't have a lot of land. You don't have big barns, so um, you need to kind of cope with very limited space. So um, I was actually watching uh, a YouTube channel called Our Wyoming Life, um, which is a farmer who also comes from a corporate previous life and just got thrown into farm life, and he completely explained um, how this was. I mean, it didn't really in affect the, the barn and everything, but how he had to learn to pull a calf or to, yeah, the feeding, the sorting of cattle and all that. And that kind of helped me to see how this guy learned everything by doing it. And that's basically what I did. So I, I tried to learn a lot through the internet by watching videos. And I also looked at different barns, how different people build up their barns and, you know, um, I would do a lot different now since I had the cattle, but it was, it's not that bad. We can work with it. So, yeah. Did you have to put up all new fencing and, and everything as well? Yes. Great work. <laughs> so is your husband, like, does he enjoy that part of it? Does he play a role in it? Or was it kind of just all on you to plan and lay it out and, and prepare? Yeah, I, I'd say it's about 90% me. Yeah, he has. That's amazing, own. though. Yeah. Well, he he runs his own company. He's in the wood industry, um, so he's quite busy with that. But he supports me whenever I really need him. So cleaning out the barn—that's what we do together. And but or when the cows get out, <laughs> <laughs> which does happen sometimes. Yeah. 
Um, and do your kids enjoy the animals? Um, not as much as me, actually. Um, they do like them, but they're not so into it. I mean, they grow up with it and they're like, yeah, we have cows, you know. When I ask my, my daughter, um, I ask her, do you want a pony? I always wanted a pony when I was a kid. I got a turtle. But, yeah. And I, I asked her, you know, do you want a pony? Um, we can put it, you know, with the cows in the program. And she's like, no, mom. I want a bird. <laughs> like, what kind of bird? Like a canary bird. You know, this tiny little yellow bird. And I was like, what? <laughs> well, we got neither. No pony, no bird. <laughs> I was like, I'm pissed. <laughs> no, it's kind of, I don't know why. Um, my son, he likes them and, and he helps me a lot out, you know. Uh, when we bring them out to the pasture, they love running after them and they love calving season. Um, but yeah, it's just normal for them. So, Is it normal for your part of the country? or So like I grew up in the Midwest here and we had Texas Longhorns and there would be people that would be driving down the road and they would stop because they've never seen one before because they weren't common, you know, to have basically outside of Texas or the Southern States. Um, is that what it's like near you? Is it, is it kind of odd for folks to have longhorns or are they becoming more common? No, 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 no. It's really, really odd. People ask me why I'm a bull breeder. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. All your cattle have horns. There must be bulls. I'm like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> They skip biology class in school. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really odd. It's really, really odd. But but people like it. They're scared of them because they have horns. They can yeah. stab you. And I'm like, how are they going to stab you? They're not going to run sideways. You know? <laughs> anyway, no, people are really scared of them sometimes because of the horn, because they're really impressive. impressive. But people think they're really beautiful, just like me. So they're... They stop by the pasture, you know, and, and look at them and yeah. So you got the pictures of the calves when they were born, the ones that you ordered. Um, what happened when you got them home? Um, you know, I think, I think I saw on your website that was in like 2017. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, you know, talk to me about the last, you know, seven years or so, um, how your herd has progressed and, and everything. Oh, well, yeah, we got them home when they were like eight months old. That was really a big day. I was so excited. So we drove out there with two horse trailers because we don't, in Europe, we don't have those huge trailers that you have in the U.S. So, and you need like a special permission and a special license to drive cattle and all that. It's crazy over here. So uh, I had a friend of mine and myself. So we went out there with two horse trailers to pick up the calves. And then we got home and we unloaded them and it was really exciting. I, I have a camera in my barn just to make sure, you know, everything is okay. And I checked, I, I checked it like five minutes at the time. So. And they all survived, luckily. No, and it was, you know, they were quite shy at the beginning. And we kept them inside because it was winter time. It was like um, the middle of December when we got them. So it was really cold and a lot of snow. And so we kept them inside to, to adjust and for us to get used to them. And we were not completely finished with our fencing outside. So, um, yeah, we had them inside for, for a few months. And it was a good time to kind of get to know them, to see how they react. Um, and I like to have a very close contact to them so that they really know me well and I know them. Mm -hmm. So I started feeding them. I started feeding them by hand and start scratching them. And yeah. And since this was one of them was my first bull and I had never had any cattle before, um, I said, okay, I want a bull who's really, really nice because they can kill you in like no time. And since I'm not experienced at all, I want to make sure that my bull is really, really nice and I can handle him well and, and I really managed to do that. So he's great. He's still here. So, And the bull was the same age as the calves. Like he wasn't a little bit older. He was born around the same time. Yeah. yeah. And I would not do that again <laughs> because I had the problem that I wanted to breed my, my heifers the first time when they're around two years old. 
Mm-hmm. But then I had the bull who was ready to go, you know, but the heifers should not get pregnant by that time. So I had to put him separate. But then I was like, okay, I have, I bought a bull calf, which is really nice. And then I have to separate him from his herd. Uh, I don't want to piss him off, you know, and he, you know, really wants to do something and, and I don't let him. So I was like, okay, what do I do with him? His name is Henry. So I said, Henry, what do we do? And I came up with the idea. Maybe I buy a, a female, which is already bred or maybe a little bit older. And that's difficult in, in Europe to find a cow. Um, and I was searching the internet up and down, calling people. I called the one breeder in Austria and asked him if he, if he would sell me one of his breeding cows or a bred heifer or something that I could put with my bull so he's not lonely and upset about it. And he's like, no, 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 he doesn't do that. And then I found a couple in Germany who had like a few highland cows and a few longhorns. And they had a female, which was, I think, six years old by the time. And they wanted to keep an offspring of her, a a bull calf, for breeding. And they needed to get rid of her because they only had one herd and they couldn't separate the bull from the herd. So it was just the other way around. And it was just a perfect match. Um, But then it turned out I cannot import her to Austria because she had some sort of disease. And we had to wait six months to get her to Austria. So I was like, oh, this doesn't help me much then. Because that's exactly <laughs> the time where I would need her. So um, another Austrian breeder who was really, really small called me because he saw that I was looking for a cow. And he had a cow who had a calf um, that died three days after birth. And this cow got crazy after that. And he wanted to slaughter her because she was, she, he couldn't go inside the barn. She was attacking him because he was taking out the dead calf. And he said, you know, I'm going to slaughter her. So if, if you want, you can, you can have her. I mean, I'm going to sell her to you. And I was like, so I want the cow that, you know, you can't go inside the barn and she's trying to kill you every time you go there. And I was like, okay, well, if he's going to slaughter her, I can take her. I can give it a try. And if it's not working out, I'm going to slaughter her. And we got her. And Henry was really happy that he had a lady. <laughs> and she was bred by the time. So um, um, there was no job for him, but he was not lonely anymore. And she was really difficult. So she was, you know, she chased me over the fence several times. Oh, wow. Um, and she didn't like men at all. So my husband couldn't get near her. And I was like, Phew. That's a good idea. I'm not sure, but we'll wait. We'll wait. Give her a bit of time. And then she kind of settled in and she realized, you know, um, there's no other calves around. There's just my heifers that like they were a year and a half by the time. And there's her bull, Henry, who was so nice with her. They would, you know, lick each other and sleep together. And he was so happy to have her. And then she kind of settled in and she relaxed. And yeah, I mean, by the time she had her calf, that was really difficult because she tried to protect it with her life. And and I bought one of those electric cattle sticks. I don't know if you have that in the U.S. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to buy that just, you know, for safety. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to hurt her, but I'm not trying to get killed either. So I went inside and I had to ear tag the calf, you know, that's the law in Austria. So I went inside, you know, with the stick in my hand like this. And I was like, oh my God, she's going to kill me. And she was looking at the stick and, you know, touching it with her nose. And then she got shocked. And then I said, get off. And I yelled at her and she was so shocked, you know, (laughs) getting shocked and me yelling that after that, when she saw the stick, she would take off. I was like, well, that was easy. Huh. And leave her calf, huh? Yes. And and then I could I could ear tech the calf and everything was fine. I mean she's she's still here, so I didn't slaughter her. She's a really good mama. She raises really good calves every year. Uh, when she has a newborn, you have to be a little bit careful, so you have to watch her. But she's never attacked me ever since. Nothing. 
So is she, so is she the only one that you've kind of added to your herd from someone else or over the years, have you found a way to incorporate more animals from other herds in Austria or Europe? Well, in total, I have three cows that I bought from other breeders. That's, you know, the, the crazy one, <laughs> the one that I wanted to import that had the disease. I did import her six months after, after quarantine. Um, and she's my lead cow now, so I'm really happy to have her. She's really great. I mean, she's from a breeding perspective, not perfect. She's fairly small and she's white with black ears. And But she's a really good lead cow. So I, I call her name and she comes running and everybody follows her. And that's really helpful. Um, and she's not, you know, she's not the cuddling type, so she doesn't want to be touched a lot. But she comes when I call her and she's really, really nosy. So whenever something's going on, she's there and she's very protective over the herd. So when there's someone coming close to the pasture, I just have to look at her and to see, is it okay or not? Because if it's not okay, she would stand in front and she would look at the others and, you know, place them. um, And she would be in front protecting the herd. And that's really amazing. I've never seen this dynamic in, in animals before. And that's, I think, a trait that longhorns have compared to other cattle. Mm-hmm. They're really protective over the herd. Yeah, there kind of always seems to be that that matriarch cow that, you know, they all look to for cues and, and who is very protective for sure. So if someone, if someone from the United States was to look at your herd or look on your website at your animals, what, what do you think would be the biggest difference in traits and, you know, breeding qualities and everything, um, with, from your herd to some of the herds here? Um, horn. Horn. We are far behind in terms of horn. Um, and I think we're quite behind in terms of overall you know, the body of the cows are, are not as good as, as what you have over there. So the overall conformation is, so when I, I look a lot on the internet on US websites <laughs> and, and when I look at the cattle there and I look at mine, I really see the difference. And, and that's basically one of my targets is, is to change that in Europe. I mean, there are a few really good cows and there are a few breeders who focus on that. But there are many breeders who just, you know, take whatever they get. And that's basically what I did at the beginning. I, I, I didn't look at anything. I just wanted longhorns and that's it. And that's a bit of a problem we have over here. So how are you? You said that you're trying to, you know, change that. What types of things are you doing or what do you have planned for the future that you're trying to work towards that more? Um, we have a very de- very limited um, genetic pool over here in Europe. So we have, of course, the genetics from this one breeder in Germany where I brought most of my cattle from. Um, since she has a very, very large herd, she has like, I don't know, 28 female cows. So it's nothing like, I, I, I saw the podcast with Randy Murray the other day and I was like, Oh, really? I mean, he has a thousand, a thousand cows? Right. Eight. Eight. That's a lot difficult, you know, to select. But, well, <laughs> she has the biggest herd with, I think, 28 or 30 female cows to, to breed. Um, and, you know, she you see her genetics, like, everywhere. So... Um, then you have a few that are doing embryo transfer, but you end up seeing the same embryos. So you see the same genetics again. They're not the same as hers, but you know exactly where they're coming from. So many of them are coming from the Dickinsons. So that, that's why I said, okay, that's not a big of an option for me because then I would have a bit more of the same, which is not what I want. So I'm... I'm in touch with a few breeders in the U.S. to maybe go a different route and and to push that into a direction where we can get faster, more different genetics to Europe. So are there also... Um... Are there also events or socials that you all kind of like get together and 
whether you bring some animals or just get together and, you know, talk about tips and tricks and kind of try to learn from each other? Is there anything like that there that, you know, would be comparable to our futurities and sales and shows? No, no, there's nothing comparable to that. And the reason is very easy because people are very lazy over here and they, <laughs> and they I don't know why, but they have trouble loading their cattle. They have trouble, you know, if they have to drive two hours, it's too far way too far <laughs> we we're in austria i mean that's like so small compared to, to the u.s <laughs> you haul the cattle from texas to ohio and kentucky and then it's like what? Uh, no nobody would do that over here and the next thing is um, there is no breeders association for texas longhorns in europe um, and there's a legal reason because if you have if, if you set up a breeding organization or a breeding association um, only the officials of the agricultural chamber can do that, and I tried it. I tried it for two years, and they always turned us down because they said the population of longhorns is too small to put all that effort in it. And even for Austria, the population of longhorns is by far too small to invest the time and the money to to even implement them into. Uh, uh, an existing breeding organization, like they have the meat cow breeding or organization, or they they just don't want to. And yeah, and you cannot go to any events where there are other cattle because people are scared of them. And what I'm doing, or what I did, is um, I sat together with a few very small breeders in Austria, and we set up our own organization uh, association, which is actually. Um, it's not a breeding organization or anything. It's for protecting animals. <laughs> and it's very difficult legally what you are allowed to set up and what not. So, but this is kind of a loophole. And that's now our, our organization in Austria, where we say that's Texas Longhorn Austria, Österreich, basically. Um, and we do a meeting once a year, at least, where all the breeders who are part of it uh, come together and we discuss how we can promote the cattle, how we can promote the meat, uh, what we can do to, to make things better, how we can sell breeding cattle and all that kind of things, what marketing we're doing. And we we last year in September, it's been the first time where a live Texas Longhorn cow was shown at, a, at an agricultural fair, at an exhibition. It took me quite a while <laughs> to get the permission to do that, but we kind of did it together as an association and we placed one cow at an Austrian um, agricultural exhibition and it was amazing. So people were, uh, our, our booth was full of people the entire time and we were dead after that. But it was really great to see that people are interested in it mm -hmm. and they want to see it, but it, it takes a lot of effort. And That's we're gonna, amazing. We're going to do it again this year. So, I have there. Has there been any other headway that you all have made through the organization? Well, we have. What do you mean exactly? Um, so that I mean, that's a pretty impressive thing that you got accomplished by having a longhorn be able to be shown. Are there other things that you, as a group, have have? gotten to do or you know strides that you've made that wouldn't have been done without the organization and all of you working together um we have sold um heifers to to the netherlands um and which is far far away from austria <laughs> um, and it doesn't make sense to sell just one or two heifers because the transport costs are killing you so I have a partner in, in the Netherlands and she asked, you know, do you have heifers for sale? And I said, yes, one. She was like, one? I was like, yeah, I only have a few cows. I mean, I don't have that many heifers. What, what do you want? I have eight cows now. By the time I had six. And she's like, okay, well, one is not, it's not that many. And then I said, wait a minute. I mean, I, I'll ask the others. I'll ask the other breeders and maybe, maybe they have something for sale. And then I asked them, and then we put together, I think, 14 or 15 heifers. 
And I made a sales catalog, really professional on Excel. <laughs> and I sent it to her and she was like, wow, that's amazing. Yes, um, if we can, you know, arrange the paperwork and the transport and everything, she, she would like to buy them. And, and then we did. And I was so amazed that we managed to do it. And, you know, we had them from four or five different breeders. And we put them to a facility here close to my place because you're not allowed in Austria or in Europe to get cattle from other farms to your farm and then transport them together from your ranch to another ranch. You need to be a certified European cattle collection facility. And it takes about two years to get certified for that. So I said, oh, wow. God, screw that. <laughs> <laughs> It was another thing where I thought, okay, I'm just going to take the cows from my ranch and then we put them on a trailer and ship them to the next place. No, 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 no. My state vet said, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah, but we managed to do it. It took us about half a year to get all the paperwork and everything done. And then we as a, as a group managed to ship those heifers to the Netherlands. And we did it for, I think, four or five times in a row. That's amazing. And I managed to find a little loophole to bring the cattle actually to my ranch. And I have to keep them for 30 days and then I can ship them. And that's what I'm doing now. So I bring the other cattle to my ranch and then I do all the paperwork and the DNA testing and the testing, the blood test for all the different diseases that you need to export them. And then off they go. Yeah. That's very. Yeah, and we, we are the only ones in Europe that are working together. Like in the other countries, like Germany, they have quite a few breeders of Texas Longhorns, but they're not working together at all. And I think that's kind of sad. Hidden Springs Ranch, located in central North Carolina, is committed to registered Texas Longhorns. From our high-end breeding stock down to our delicious Longhorn beef sticks, check us out at hslonghorns.com or on Instagram at Hidden Springs Ranch. Hidden Springs Ranch, where they're bred to turn heads. Looking for top quality longhorns and a taste of true Texas spirit? Look no further than Kentara Cattle Company. Our passion for longhorns shines at Old Gringo Ranch, where tradition meets excellence. Visit us online at CantaraCattleCompany.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok for the latest updates and ranch life fun. Ready to experience it yourself? Schedule your visit by emailing canterracattle at gmail.com. Remember, God is great, longhorns are good, and life is crazy. From the Pasture by Hired Hand is presented by R3 Hilltop Ranch. Located in Chilton, Texas, R3 Hilltop Ranch has been breeding registered Texas longhorns since 2006. What began as three heifers has grown into our current herd, which you can explore on our website at r3hilltop.com. We're passionate about loud colors, longhorns, and docile temperaments, but it's the easy keeping, low maintenance traits of Texas longhorns that initially attracted us and continue to drive our herd growth. In addition to livestock, we proudly offer certified longhorn beef products. Visit r3hilltop.com forward slash beef to learn more. Thank you for listening and enjoy exploring our ranch online at r3hilltop.com. Do you sometimes feel like you're the only one who doesn't have it all figured out? Rural life can be isolating, but it doesn't have to be. Welcome to Ag's Most Okayest Farm Girls, the podcast for women who are craving connection, laughter, solidarity, camaraderie, and just overall encouragement in your everyday life and dreams. Each week, your hosts, Annalise, that's me, and Courtney will cover topics such as farm life, mom life, making money online, side hustles, hobbies, sharing on social media, jobs off the farm, and so much more. Us rural gals need to stick together, so saddle up for some fun, real, and unsolicited advice and and stories from our everyday farm lives. Grab a drink. We're Egg's Most Okayest Farm Girls, and we're here to help. Listen wherever you find podcasts. Hey, if you love From the Pasture with Hired Hand, why not go check out my podcast, The Big Iron Podcast with Andrew Shigori, where we dive into the world of registered Texas longhorns and what it means to be an agriculture entrepreneur in the modern world, with a little southern flair, of course. Find the Big Iron Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Love what you're hearing? Be sure to check out our pickup truck confessions. 
It's a video series where we hop in the truck or a rental car and interview a variety of breeders about what drives their passion for their livestock, how they got started in the breed of their choice, marketing tips, and more. And now back to the podcast. So if this, if this podcast gets out, you know, and gets good publicity in Europe, what would your, what would kind of your call or your advice to your fellow breeders who are listening? What, what would you say to them? I think it would be great to, to get internationally in Europe more a platform where we can talk to each other. So, um, I mean, we will not manage to get something like futurities like you have. Um, that that's just so far away. I don't think we will anytime soon manage to do that. Of course, it would be great because then you can see what quality of cattle are out there and where are you with your program because you have no comparison at all. So I have my herd. My herd is perfect, according to me, because I have nobody else to look at it. So um, that's a bit of a problem. So I, I think that's what drives... Well, there is at least no big improvement in quality because you have no comparison. That's kind of sad. So I think it would be really great if there would be more people um, pushing for better quality and for comparison. And if it doesn't have to be like a competition, it shouldn't be. It should just be, you know, an exchange of information and an exchange of thoughts and, and discussing things and maybe, yeah, helping each other out sometimes. Yeah. What about what, what advice would you have or what, you know, what would you want to say to breeders in the United States that are listening that, you know, maybe want to get involved in, I know you said you're talking to a few already about, you know, embryos and kind of the future, but, you know, if other folks wanted to get involved, what would you say to them? Put your calves on the internet before they're vaccinated. <laughs> That's a big thing that we have over here. When I try to look for potential animals where we can bring the genetics over here, by the time I see them on the web pages of the breeders, they're vaccinated and they're out of the game. So what's really cool for me is to see the breeding information, to see which cow has been bred to which bull. You see that only on a few web pages, and they're not very, I mean, I don't know, if you have a herd of a thousand cows, it's not that easy to keep up all this information. I understand that. Um, <laughs> that's information that's really, really cool for me to see, okay, um, I do have a few favorite cows, you know, that I look at, and, and a few favorite breeders where I know they're using this and that bulls, and then I look at the matings, but by the time I see the calves that, got out of those meetings on the internet, they're vaccinated because then they have, yeah. And then I can't use them for your at all. That's, that's a bit of a problem. So I need to catch them before they're, they're vaccinated. And I know it's difficult because I know people like Randy Murray or so, they, they, they get calves every day. <laughs> and, and by the time they're weaned, they're vaccinated. So mm -hmm. they bring them in once or twice a year, the whole herd, and then they wean the calves. By the time they're weaning them, they're vaccinating them, they're taking pictures and put them on the internet. And then I see them and I'm like, oh my God, those, those are pretty calves. I really like them. And then I, yeah, they're vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, for us, it would be really helpful to have this information a little bit earlier. Or to, if you have somebody who's really interested in, in doing something for Europe, um, to get in touch with me or to get in touch with us um, so we can, we can discuss um, how, how to do that or what mating state planning or something. So for can, you yes. can you speak a little bit to, um, like, let's say that there were calves you found that weren't vaccinated. Can you speak a little bit to what the process would be that follows if you wanted to import them? Um, I cannot import the, the calf itself. So it will stay in the U.S. anyway. But um, it could get to a breeding station and it could be certified for uh, semen export or it could be certified to produce embryos. So to be used on a cow um, to flush. 
And what do you, when you're on the internet looking for those types of animals, what are the like top two traits that you're looking for to improve your herd? It's color and overall conformation. So um, I'm not, I'm, I'm, of course, horn is also a topic, but it's not that big because people are scared of longhorns in Europe anyway. So if you have like a hundred inch animals, yeah. Um, we are happy if we have like 60 or 70 inch overall. I mean, we have a few that are 80 inch, but that's like, I think five animals in total in Europe. Um, so we are so far behind. Of course, that that's a thing that we need to improve. Uh, but for me personally, um, color is really important because that's what sells over here. So a flashy calf is immediately sold. Um, it doesn't matter if it has horns or not. I mean, it should have horns, but, you know, the rest is not so important. And I'm of the opinion that those are, those are meat cattle, you know, so they should have meat on their bones um, so that you can use the ones that you're not using for breeding for something else. That's why I think weight and, and the overall conformation is important really important and what i what i don't like is i've seen that in, in dog breeding for example where you know they focus so much on certain traits that in the end the animals are suffering from it so like certain dog breeds that can't give natural birth to their puppies because the heads are too big that's something i really want to avoid and i'm a bit worried where the direction of horn will go because there is a limit to it. I mean, they're not going to have 200-inch horn. <laughs> you know, their necks are going to break <laughs> sooner or later. And I'm, I'm looking at the age of when, when those animals are, are dying. And I, I fear that they're going to get younger and younger. And that's not what I want to see overall. So I think horn is a little bit critical. It's great and it's nice and it's beautiful, but there should, you know, health should not be the, the you know, suffer from, from that. No, I think that's, that's a great point. Um, let's switch gears a little bit and tell me about a few of your favorites that you have in your herd. <laughs> my, my large herd. Is <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's one of them. That's, that's crazy. Um, and she accidentally got bred by Henry because she jumped the fence when she was 14 months old. So she's oh. very small. <laughs> she got a healthy calf and I was like, how, how can this happen one night? And they're just, you know, <laughs> teenagers. <laughs> yeah. So she got a really young mom and that you can still tell she's very small, but she's, she's so friendly and she's like a puppy, you know. Whenever she has a calf, she comes and shows me. She's like, look, I have a new calf. And she's so, um, she's not, you know, she's really, really nice. Whenever I walk in the pasture, she comes up to me, puts her head on the ground so I can give her scratches. And so that's, and, and yeah, she's, besides that, she's really small. I really like her, her, her horn. And, yeah, she really always has flashy calves, full calves all the time bull calves all the time unfortunately but yeah no she's one of my favorites actually and, and did you I, I know anyone listening and not watching can't see it but it, there's a beautiful painting uh behind lisa here on the interview did you make the painting or did you commission it um a friend of mine made it it's if, beautiful if i did it, it it probably wouldn't look like that <laughs> <laughs> it's very beautiful yeah. Then, of course, I have my bull, Henry. Um, he's just, he's, uh, when I look at the bulls that you have in the U.S., he's nothing to compare. He's nothing special. He has no great horn. He has really bad conformation. But he's the sweetest and nicest guy. And I have two little kids, and they can go to the pasture, and he just comes up, and is he's so friendly, and he passes that on to his calves. I even had a breeder bring one of his calves to my place, to, to breed with Henry because she was so crazy and he tried to AI her and it just wouldn't work because she, she would, you cannot lock her up and anything. So he brought her to my, my place and 
it worked out perfect. And she got a bull calf out of that, um, who was just like Henry. He was so friendly, and, and they, they sold him for 5,000 euros, which is a great deal. <laughs> so that's why I really like him. I mean, when I look at the bulls that you have in the U.S., I'm like, oh, my God, I, I wish he was better from a confirmation and everything. But his character is just key. And well, one, one thing that keeps going through my mind when, when I'm listening to you is, and, and maybe this is, you know, it's probably easier for me to say in hindsight than for you to be patient and wait for it to happen. But when I was looking at your website, a lot of your animals reminded me of the animals I had when I was younger. And so if you think, you know, I mean, yes, it's been like 20 some <laughs> years, but you should be able to make those strides more quickly because you're able to research what works and what doesn't, you know, to make the gains that you're wanting to see in body and, and color and that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, I think you need to give yourself more credit. I don't, I don't think you're quite as far behind as what you, <laughs> what you feel like you are. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's really good to hear. Yeah, because when I look on the internet or when I look, I love watching the the live stream um, for auctions. And then I see all those animals and, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I wish I could be there and just buy <laughs> one and bring it over here. <laughs> and you have such a great variety where breeders can choose from. We don't have that. You know, you have to yeah. deal with what you have. And it makes it quite difficult to improve it because there's not much you can select. And when I hear Randy Murray saying he selects, about, he selects out 80%. I'm like, if I did that, I end up with one calf. <laughs> so, yeah, well, <laughs> uh, that's that's you know, time is a big topic. It takes forever. It yeah. really takes forever, and it's it's a big investment you make. When I bought my first calves, I knew it would take about four years until I get any kind of money back. Um, that's something you have to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're definitely in a different boat there. You're required to be, you're up against a lot more challenges and required to be even more patient than, you know, a lot of the, the, the breeders here. Yeah, I mean, I see people buying the most expensive cattle and have in like one year a herd where other breeders would need a decade to get to because you just, you have the option to buy them. You can yeah. go to an auction and you buy a cow for 7,000 euros. I mean, pay if you have the money, yes, but um, at least you have the option. Or, I mean, there's a few heifers that are just great. They're sold for an affordable amount of money. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that over here. You don't, yeah. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking you said you're watching all these hired hand live sales. That's, if I'm doing the time switch, the time change correctly, you're, you're basically up in the middle of the night, right? <laughs> My husband loves that. <laughs> That's some dedication right there. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, what haven't I asked you about that you feel like is important to share with the folks who listen to our podcast? Um, what, what I really want to mention is um, the British organizations you have in the U.S., like the ITLA and TLBA. Um, I'm part of both of them because I couldn't decide which one is better um, or more suitable for international business. And I, I would love to see a bit more dedication from them towards the international market, especially Europe. Um, because we have like like the futurities or something, we, ha we don't have a lot of chances to get our cattle evaluated in any kind of way by professionals. I can get them evaluated over here, but, you know, people don't have any knowledge about longhorns, so they don't know what to look for. Um, so um, there is an ITLA judging clinic once a year. Um, I've, I've participated three times, um, but I wish there would be a little bit more, more than that to support European breeders or international breeders. I, I can't speak so much about other other areas in the world. Um, but I think that will be really important to educate the people, to educate what to look for. What what I, I didn't have that. I 
I bought just any kind of longhorns back then. And still, you know, the main trait I'm looking for is color. And and that I think would, would be really great to have. Or to have somebody that you can contact where you say, okay, I, I'll send you pictures or maybe we can make a, a live stream, go through my pasture and you look at my cattle and tell me what's good and what's bad. That would be really great to have. Um, I think that's a great ask. Um, the ITLA is, is doing the judging clinic, which is great, which is in the middle of the night. <laughs> 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 they record it. You can also. And what's a big topic is it's all in English. So there's a lot of breeders here in Europe that don't speak English at all. So I, I asked a few, do you want to participate in the judging clinic? And they, they said, yes, but I don't understand a single word they're saying. It will be pointless then, yes. So what I did once is I, I, I watched it and, and I took notes and I translated it to German. Um, and, and I told the other breeders about it and, and shared it. But, you know, that's a lot of effort. And I have two kids. I have a farm. I, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a, a lot of work. And I think something like that would be really cool to have, to have some guidelines or something. For sure. I think I, I agree. I could see where that would be frustrating. <laughs> yes, it, it even starts with the color. You know, when you register a calf, the Austrian breeders write brown and white as a color description for every calf or black and white <laughs> or black. They, they don't even write solid red because they don't know the terms. So it would be like that. that it would be cool to have, you know, picture of, of different colors and the description. What do you call it? That would be really cool. I have trouble myself. How, how do you know, describe? Yeah, that's a great point. Things that we probably take for granted that are easier for us to get answers to, you know, are, are different for you all to, to get answers to. Yeah, in Austria, we have Holsteins and Fleckfi. They're black and white or red and white. So <laughs> those terms they're familiar with, but the rest, like Brindle or Parker Brown, uh, a lady once sent me a picture and, and she's like, yeah, I have a black calf. And I said, it's not black, it's Parker Brown. It's what? Said, it's Parker Brown. I've never heard this term before. <laughs> so, and, and she's been breeding longhorns longer than me. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your afternoon right afternoon to uh to join me i i really appreciate it i know we were talking a little bit before we got started and your kids are off reading and, and your dogs are being quiet and <laughs> i just i know it's a busy time for you so i appreciate it yeah thank you so much for having me for giving me this opportunity i feel really honored of we course i <laughs> I feel like we'll have to do a follow up in a year or two and and hear more about all the progress you made cuz I can tell that you're you're definitely making strides and working hard to to change things for for European breeders. Yes, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me.